All right, guys, how's it going? Last Friday, NVIDIA launched their other Turing, the GTX Turing 1660 Ti. Friday is an odd day to launch a graphics card, and in fact, you'll often hear in many industries that you should never launch on a Friday. It's usually a bad sign, a sign that your product may not be quite as good as hoped. The last Friday GPU launch I can remember was the ill-fated GTX 480, Fermi. And we all know how that ended up. So that was a surprise for me, as I expected this GTX Turing to be pretty good, to be honest. It was later pointed out to me that while yes, it was a Friday launch, it's also the last Friday in the month. Payday for most of us. Nvidia doesn't miss many tricks, I assure you. So what is this GTX Turing? Well, you remember way back to August when I leaked the Turing information, including the segmentation between RTX and GTX. As you can see, the codename of TU116 lines up, however, the card was actually branded as the GTX 1660 Ti instead of the GTX 2060. There's a couple of other differences as well, for example, the 5 gigabytes of VRAM was what I was told, but as I said in that video, I didn't particularly like. Before I take a look at a selection of the benchmarks, let's take a look at what exactly this GTX Turing is. We know all about RTX Turing by now. It's a follow-up to NVIDIA's extremely successful Pascal architecture and it introduced RTX, ray tracing, utilising the new RT cores and including tensor cores, which we saw previously in NVIDIA's high-end Volta architecture. However, adding all these RT cores and tensor cores obviously meant a large increase in chip sizes and TU-102, the RTX Titan and the 2080 Ti chip we see here, came in at a mammoth 754 square millimetres, with the 2080 being 545 square millimetres, which is still very large for a GPU. As we can see, the largest Pascal GP-102 was only 471 square millimetres. So Nvidia even took the unprecedented step of creating a smaller die though still a large die at 445 square millimetres for the 2070 class of chip, which was codenamed TU-106. And this of course also spawned the RTX 2060, which was simply a cut down version of this card. So RTX cores and tensor cores means bigger die sizes, which in turn means production costs are higher. The new GTX Turing though does away with both of these, and what you have left is essentially RTX Turing minus the RTX. Now, over at Anantech, and that was also their assumption. However, on digging a little bit deeper, they discovered it wasn't quite that simple. RTX Turing introduced more than just RTX. It also got concurrent execution of Int32 and FP32. And here in this block diagram of an RTX Turing streaming multiprocessor, we also see the tensor cores next to those. Now concurrent Int32 and FP32 remains with the GTX Turing, and I will take a closer look at that later. Alongside concurrent Int32 and FP32, the tensor cores in RTX Turing allow for pure FP16 ops. Turing's tensor cores are of course far more than that, able to accumulate FP32 and adaptable down to Int4 as you can see here with such low precision possibly being utilised in some deep learning applications, along with the more widely used Int8. However, in this context, the tensor cores are used as pure FP16, alongside the concurrent FP32 and Int32. I realise a lot of that probably went over some of your heads, and I'll talk about this properly in a future video. For gaming purposes, FP32 still rules by far, but we're starting to see FP16 utilised in more recent games, including Wolfenstein 2 and Far Cry 5, games which I'll take a look at later. So if you think about it, by removing the tensor cores and the RTX cores for the GTX Turing, Nvidia also removed the capability to do pure FP16. However, they decided they wanted to retain that FP16 capability alongside FP32 and Int32, and so have included dedicated FP16 cores on the GTX Turing chip. This is the streaming multiprocessor of the GTX Turing. So basically, consider these dedicated FP16 cores as a substitution for the Tensor Core's FP16 mode while removing any ability for the main job of tensor cores in RTX Turing, 
which is the part that performs denoising at the end of the ray tracing pipeline and also deep learning super sampling. So to sum this part up, GTX Turing is more like RTX Turing minus all the ray tracing elements and DLSS and then given substitute dedicated FP16 cores. That's actually quite a lot of change given it's the same Turing architecture name. But by removing all of these ray tracing elements and by also giving the GTX 1660 Ti fewer CUDA cores, 1536 for the 1660 Ti compared to 1920 on the RTX 2060 means that the GTX 1660 Ti chip codenamed TU116 at only 284 square millimetres is quite a lot smaller than the RTX chips. I'll talk more about the economics of this later on in the video, but now let's take a look at performance from a selection of websites, which we will start by staying at Anantech. For this part, I'm just going to take a look at some benchmark results and try to figure out what it's all about. Starting off with Far Cry 5, which is interesting for the aforementioned FP16 utilization, which is mostly used in the game's water engine. The in-game benchmark shows a lot of water, and perhaps that's not surprising given that AMD sponsored this title, and Vega has much stronger FP16 capability compared to the consumer Pascal. In the case of the 1660 Ti, which as you just learned performs FP16 separately in dedicated cores, this likely helps it to scrape a win versus the 1070 Founders Edition. The 1660 Ti is also nearly 20% ahead of the similarly priced RX 590. Now taking a quick look at Wolfenstein 2, remember that was another game supporting FP16, and this time we see a bigger win for the 1660 Ti over the 1070 Founders Edition. Interesting to see that also the RX 590 beats the GTX 1070 Founders Edition, but we've seen this over and over with the RTX cards as well. Turing plays exceptionally well with Wolfenstein 2, even better than Vega does. And looking at the rest of the benchmarks at Anantech, the 1660 Ti appears to be around about tied with the 1070 Founders Edition and is clearly ahead of the RX 590 in all cases. Moving over to Hot Hardware and their Shadow of the Tomb Raider result. The latest Tomb Raider game is another where Turing performs quite well. And again we see it here with the 1660 Ti beating the 1070 by, and that's a fair margin of just over 10%. The reason I highlighted this game though was due to this slide, where we see Shadow of the Tomb Raider, chosen by Nvidia to showcase concurrent floats and ints. Now, as I said earlier, FP32 still rules by far, and looking at this slide, I would say that the average game had far less than one third of integer instructions on average. However, this latest Tomb Raider is up at 38 integer instructions, with the floats at 62. Remember that Pascal can't do these concurrently, and we see in the case of the 1060 here, this same sequence would require 100 instruction slots compared to only 62 instruction slots on the 1660 Ti. Pascal has to do one or the other, Turing can do them concurrently, and here is a pretty solid clue to Turing's good performance in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Of course, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a GameWorks title, and Nvidia will of course be heavily optimising for Turing today instead of Pascal, and will be doing so from this point forward. It's just perhaps worth noting that a lot of the games we are seeing benchmarked today do have optimizations which suit Turing more than Pascal. Many of those games are AMD titles in fact, including Wolfenstein and Forza Horizon 4 and Far Cry 5, but if you benchmarked a random 20 games from the past couple of years, you may not quite see the same wins for these Turing cards. This is just about optimization and architecture, and I feel Nvidia has done a good job at getting Turing shown in the best possible light, as those games I mentioned are often benchmarked. And to be fair, they were heavily benchmarked before Turing existed because AMD wanted them shown due to Vega's good performance compared to Pascal. It just happens that when Vega does well, Turing also does well, if not better. Continuing with the benchmarks though and over at PC Gamer, and they have a 19 game average of performance, starting at 1080p Ultra, which I feel is the right resolution for this card. And we see a small win over the GTX 1070 Founders Edition. And the card is also just lagging the RX Vega 56 by a small margin. Versus the Pascal 1060, 6GB, we see a win of 36%. 
and between 30 and 36% was around the normal gap that we saw against that card. There is also a large 24% lead over AMD's competing RX 590. The pecking order doesn't really change with the move to 1440p. However, all these cards are now hovering around the 60 FPS average, which means dips below and is the main reason why I believe we're really looking at a 1080p card here. And now moving over to Tech Power Up, who tested around 20 games and looking at the performance summary of each resolution, at 1080p performance is equal to the GTX 1070. It's just behind Vega 56 and it's a long way ahead of both the 590 and the outgoing 1060. We see a similar story at 1440p and it's only really at 4K where we see a difference as the Vega 56 pulls further ahead. However, nobody's buying these cards for 4K, so it's pretty moot. Over at Tom's Hardware, the card ties with the 1070. It's a little behind Vega 56 and it is well ahead of the RX 590 and the outgoing 1060. And if we just finish where we started back at Anantech and we find that the GeForce GTX 1660 Ti delivers around 37% more performance than the GTX 1060 6GB at 1440p and a very similar 36% gain at 1080p and performance frequently ending up neck and neck with what was the GTX 1070. Meanwhile, AMD is going to have to significantly reposition the $279 RX 590 as the GTX 1660 Ti cleanly beats it in performance and power efficiency, delivering 25% better performance for a bit over half the power consumption. I could have made a bunch of fancy charts showing all this, but it would just have been a waste of time. The 1660 Ti is basically tied with the 1070 Founders Edition. It's around 5-10% to behind Vega 56, growing as much as 15% up at 4K resolution. And it's maybe around 25% ahead of the RX 590 and therefore 35% ahead of the GTX 1060. That's what you'll see in most cases and it's actually been quite surprising seeing the agreement among the tech press on the card's performance. Now, with that boring stuff out of the way, and yes, that is how I see benchmarks today, boring, I'll spend some time on the analysis of the card and what it all means. I'll start with the TU116 chip, analysing the economics of that. Now, as always, grain of salt with this stuff, as exact information of this nature, is not easy to come by. So there's going to be rough guides here and estimates there. Hopefully, though, it should be ballpark or at least good enough to get the point. We know the RTX Turing chips were very large, mostly due to the inclusion of RT and Tensor cores. The new TU116 chip for the 1660 Ti is 284 square millimeters. And here's a shot courtesy of video cards of TU116 on the left and TU106 on the right. So this is the 1660 Ti and this is the RTX 2070, 2060. There's quite a difference in size looking at those. This was 445 square millimeters compared to 284 square millimeters. The last time that Nvidia launched a chip near this size was the Kepler GK104, which was the GTX 680 and a die size of 294 square millimeters. GP104, the Pascal GTX 1080, was 314 square millimeters. So that's 10.5% larger than TU116. The 1080 is actually around 17 to 20 percent faster. However, if you look at the power numbers, the GTX 1080 is drawing 166 watts on average during an average gaming load compared to only 118 watts of the 1660 Ti. 41% more power required for 20% more performance makes the Turing card look a little more efficient at least. If we go in the other direction to the GTX 1060, we have GP106 and it's bang on 200 square millimeter die size. So the 1660 Ti is around 35% faster than that, but also 42% larger. This comparison is perhaps the best comparison as both chips have 192 bit memory buses, though Turing's is GDDR6 capable, while the Pascal GP106 is only capable of GDDR5. I couldn't find the exact details, but in terms of area required on the chip, it's not going to be a huge difference between those memory buses. According to Samsung, GDDR6 does use around 30% less power than the fastest GDDR5 modules, 
So you could be talking perhaps 10 watts less power draw on the new GDD R6 VRAM. Looking at this though, 116 watts for the GTX 1060 and 118 watts for the 1660 Ti. This is card power, but there's not going to be a huge difference between the power draw of each chip. And based on the performance of each card, with Turing being that 35% faster than the Pascal card it replaces, Nvidia have clearly made another improvement in performance per watt. It's not anything like what they achieved in the transition between Kepler and Maxwell, but they have made yet another step forward. But as mentioned, this improvement has come at the cost of extra area. TU-116 is 42% larger than GP-106, the chip it replaces. And the RTX lineup's huge die sizes were also used by some commentators to justify Nvidia's enormous price increases. However, most of them simply failed to understand that, yes, while the size of the chips did increase, other production costs have decreased since Pascal launched in the early to mid-2016. Now again, this information is not easy to come by. Wafer prices and yield are heavily guarded secrets, but you hear numbers like $6,000, $4,000, 75% yield, even 90% plus yield. All I can say for sure is that when Pascal launched in early to mid-2016, the wafer cost would have been a lot higher than it is today. If you just drag out the silicon cost calculator again, let's take GP106. We know it's 200 square millimeters. That was on 16 nanometers. And let's just say it had a yield rate of 80%, which is probably a little bit generous in fact. That would give us 306 gross dies per wafer. And let's just say that was a $6,000 wafer cost. So for each GP106 chip, the silicon cost of that would be $24.51. Almost three years later though, Keep an eye on this gross dies per wafer while I enter 284. And we saw there that the gross dies per wafer dropped from 306 down to 209. And therefore the cost per each chip rose from $24.51 to $35.89. However, the cost of each wafer will have decreased fairly dramatically since early 2016 as well. This is simply through efficiencies and economies of scale. And the simple fact is that you really do pay through the nose very early on on a new process. And it was right at the start of the new process when Pascal was launched. You remember how hard it was to get hold of one. The cards were out of stock for months. So let's say now, at the beginning of 2019, the cost per wafer is $4,000 instead of $6,000. And with that one change, we see that the cost of this Turing TU116 chip is actually a little bit less than the smaller Pascal chip. I just left the yield at the same 80% to reflect that larger dies are harder to yield, but also that yield improves naturally as the process improves over time. And also, according to Wikichip at least, in late 2016, TSMC announced a 12 nanometer process, which uses the similar design rules as the 16 nanometer node, but has a tighter metal pitch, providing a slight density improvement. The enhanced process is said to feature lower leakage and better cost characteristics. Again, there's a lot of guesswork involved, but hopefully you can see that even if my numbers were 100% off, the idea that Nvidia had to raise RTX prices by hundreds of dollars due to larger die sizes is just a joke. They raised prices in order to make more money. The additional silicon cost is negligible. It's true that wafer prices have been improving over time during Pascal's life cycle as well, of course. So these early Pascal costs, they would also lower over time. But the same will also ring true for Turing and 12 nanometer wafer prices will continue to drop even over the next couple of years. Though perhaps not quite as dramatically as the 33% decrease in cost that I showed for 16 nanometers. Now, with Turing 116 and the GTX 1660 Ti, Nvidia has raised prices by $30. It's the same 6GB of VRAM, however now it's GDDR6 instead of GDDR5. This will add cost. GDDR5 launched in 2009 with the AMD 4870. So by the time Pascal launched in 2016, the technology was very mature and heavily produced by multiple parties. GDDR6 is new with Turing, so costs will undoubtedly be higher. Again, you can probably figure that exact numbers on this are hard to come by. But we got some kind of decent guess over at 3D Center, using prices from a components retailer called Component Smart, which shows unit prices of 1 gigabyte GDDR5 and GDDR6 chips based on the purchase of 2000 pieces. Now, 
Clicking on these links takes us directly to the page where you can purchase your very own GDD R6 memory modules. We know that the 1660 Ti uses the slowest 12 gigabits per second chips. So let's click on this one here. And if we just enter six pieces, that's for the six gigabytes of VRAM, gives us a total of $64.74. Now the 8 gigabits per second GDDR5, which isn't the fastest today, clicking on that link and again entering 6 and we get $41.18. So the difference between these two is $23.56, which is still below the $30 increase in the cost of the card over the previous GTX 1060. However, Nvidia will be buying these chips in bulk by the hundreds of thousands and even by the millions, directly from Micron and all the other manufacturers too. They will surely be paying quite a lot less than what this component retailer asks us to pay, possibly even as much as 40% lower prices. Which if we take as true, would mean that the cost Nvidia pays for 6 gigabyte of 12 gigabits per second GDDR6 would be more like $39 while well, 6 gigabyte of 8 gigabits per second GDDR5 would have cost them around $25. So that would mean a difference of only $14. Again, the point here is that yes, while GDDR6 is more expensive than GDDR5, it's more than covered by the increase in the cost of the card. Now, finishing off with my summary and feelings about Nvidia's new card. First of all, meet the new number one best selling card as per the Steam hardware survey. It hasn't happened yet, of course, but it will be there by the end of the year. Trust me on that one. Against the competing AMD RX 590, it is a complete destruction. The 1660 Ti is 25% faster at nearly half the power consumption, and that launch at least the same $279 price. No number of free games can make the 590 a good buy at anywhere near the same price. Vega 56, while being slightly faster, around 5-10% to 10 faster than the 1660 Ti at playable resolutions, is even more power hungry. Yes, it's got 8 gigabytes of HBM2, and as you saw, it's clearly a faster card at 4K, and will likely remain a faster card over time. However, even at the same cost, the extra power consumption would make it a worsening deal over time. And I get it that a lot of you simply don't care about power consumption, but higher power consumption generally means more heat, more noise, because these things are harder to cool. But look, if you only care about performance, then by all means get a Vega 56 instead. But as far as I'm concerned, Vega 56 needs to be the same price to be competitive. And as we all know, 8 gigabytes of HBM2 certainly isn't cheap. I'm sure AMD will slash prices on both Vega and Polaris because they have to. Clearly, however, what they really need is Navi to be out yesterday. The competing Nvidia part is the RTX 2060, which is around about 20% faster and also has RTX. However, it costs $70 more. Yep, it is just about close enough to make you consider being upsold, right? And looking at this final Anantec table, we can see why that is. The relative performance per dollar of the 1660 Ti is just a little better than the RTX 2060 when compared to the outgoing GTX 1060. I really feel here that Nvidia could have made a real killer card had they kept the same 250 bucks as the 1060 was at launch. But corporate margins win out easily versus creating killer cards when your opponent is already on life support. The main drawback I can see with the GTX 1660 Ti is that it doesn't have RTX. All that stuff I said about RTX being used as a weapon against AMD, the exact same thing now stands for Nvidia's own mainstream champion. If you feared buying an AMD card because a game works, because of physics, etc, then you should also fear buying the 1660 Ti because of RTX. Nvidia would certainly like you to feel compelled to upgrade again in two years time because your card went obsolete just a little faster than you expected. One thing that I haven't seen discussed anywhere though is the possibility of Nvidia launching even faster cards based on this GTX Turing architecture. I wouldn't put it past them and if removing RTX can increase clock speeds or otherwise help performance, Nvidia wouldn't think twice about launching a faster non-RTX series. I wonder how RTX buyers would feel about that though, if that happened. But I'm done with this one. 
The GTX 1660 Ti is clearly the mainstream card to buy, and while I dislike the ever-increasing prices of mainstream cards, in this case, it's not actually that bad, and can be justified due to the faster, more expensive GDDR6 VRAM. You're also getting more FPS for your dollar than before, which as we see here, wasn't always the case with RTX. From the competition's perspective, Polaris needs to be a hell of a lot cheaper, like sub $200 for the RX 590, and Vega 56 needs to be $250. I don't expect AMD will do either of these, and Nvidia's market share gains will be deserved. I'll catch you later, guys.